Hello and welcome to this video for CE 106. So in this video, what we are going to do is to discuss uh, an algorithm that allows you to accelerate simulation. One thing that is very costly in atomic simulation is to compute the interatomic energy between pairs of atoms. So if you could find a way to reduce the number of times that you have to compute this uh, energy between pairs of atoms, then you can save a lot of computing time. And this is the idea of the neighbor list algorithm. That's an efficient algorithm that can reduce the number of time you have to compute the energy between uh, in atoms uh, that uh, interact with each other. So let's consider that you have uh, an ensemble of um, n atoms uh, within a box. So you have um, uh, a given number of uh, atoms that interact with each other, and those atoms are located within uh, a cubic box, for example. And so the main idea is that if you want to conduct an atomic scale simulation to predict how those atoms are going to be moving or interacting with each other, then the key ingredient is going to be to calculate the, the energy of interaction, the potential energy of um, interaction between atoms. So there's different models for this, and we have discussed it in a previous video. But uh, in many cases, the potential energy will only depend on the distance between the atoms. So it means that if you have a given atom I and a given atom J, if you know the distance uh, between this pair of atoms, then you can calculate the, their potential energy. And so, for example, we have um, the, the Lennard jones potential, which is one example of potential energy, which tells you that uh, in this model, the energy for a pair of atoms will be given by this function that depends only on the, the distance between the atoms. So in this case, if you want to calculate the total energy of the system, so you will need to calculate the energy of each pair of atoms. And for this, there will be two steps. You will need to calculate the distance between each pair of atoms. And then based on this distance, you will need to calculate the energy for this pair of atoms uh, as a function of their distance. And then you would uh, sum up all those energy for each pair of atoms to get the total energy. So those two things cost some computing time. Calculating the distance between the atoms, for example, in this case, if you are in three dimension, calculating the distance between a pair of atoms, what you would need to do is to calculate the, the difference uh, of their position on the x-axis and the, their uh, distance um, on the, along the y-axis, and the uh, same thing, their distance um, along the, the z-axis, and then take the, the square of each of those distance, uh, sum them up, and take the square root. So calculating the, the, the Euclidean distance between pairs of atoms is a, a, an operation that takes some time, especially if you have n atoms, then you have n times n minus 1 over 2 pairs of atoms. So that's something that is proportional to the n square. It scales with n square. So if you have n atoms, the number of time you will need to compute their distance is uh, the, the number of atoms to, uh, to the square. So it's um, the number of times you will need to perform this operation increases much faster than the number of atoms with a, a, a square relationship, a, sc a square scaling law. And similarly, whenever you will need to calculate the, the, the potential energy, this is also a complex operation. Um, in this case, the Lennard Jones is a pretty simple function, but you have some more complex function. For example, the, the, when, when you calculate, when you use the, the Buckingham relationship, in this case, the Buckingham relationship is given by the sum of an exponential relationship plus uh, a Van der Waals term. And in this case, for example, calculating an exponential function is something that is going to take some computing time. So if you have to calculate this n times n minus 1 over 2 times, that is going to be something that is going to take a significant computing time if you have thousands or maybe even millions of atoms. So if we can reduce the number of times that we compute the, um, the energy between the atoms, 
or if we can reduce the number of times we compute the distance between the atoms, then we will be able to save time uh, within the simulation. So the first thing is how can we uh, reduce the number of time we compute the energy of interaction between pairs of atoms. And for this, the, the one first idea that we can use is to use an interaction cutoff. For example, if you consider the Lennard Jones potential, the Lennard Jones potential, just like any potential, is going to be uh, always um, uh, comprising a term that uh, corresponds to the, the short range repulsion between the atoms and a term that corresponds to the short range attraction uh, between the atoms. And just like many, at many potential, this potential is eventually going to go towards zero at large distance. Because if you are at large distance, then the atoms are very far away from each other, so they should not interact with each other. So if you plot this uh, Lennard-Jones potential or most of the other two-body potential, if you plot them as a function of the distance, it's typically going to look like this, where you have this uh, short-range repulsion that prevents the atoms from overlapping with each other. And then you have the, the attraction term that uh, will um, govern the cohesion between the atoms. But um, at large distance, when you look at the limit of this function, when you look at, at large distance, the, the value of the interaction potential becomes eventually zero. Um, and this comes from the fact that, again, if you have some atoms that are very far away from each other, then they will not see each other. They will not um, interact with each other because they are too far away to uh, apply any interaction on each other. So here, if we directly use this um, relationship and if we apply it to all the atoms within the, the system, we are wasting a lot of time if we do that because if we take this atom I here and this atom J, they are very far away from each other. And since they are very far away, their interaction energy is going to be very small. So in this case, it's not really worth it to compute the interaction energy between atom I and atom J because it's going to be a very minuscule energy that will not really contribute a lot to the, to the dynamics of the system. So one thing we can do since um, this energy between atom I and atom J is going to be very small, then we can what we can do is to neglect it. So we can say that if two atoms are far enough from each other, then we will not bother to compute their interatomic energy because it's going to be so small, it's not going to contribute to the, um, to the energy of the system anyway. And the way you can achieve that is to define a cutoff. So you would define a cutoff distance. And this cutoff distance is going to correspond to the, the distance at which you consider that um, the, the potential energy becomes so small that it can be neglected. So uh, typically, this cutoff can be uh, anywhere between uh, three times or five times the, the diameter of the atom. So for example, here, if you have here the, 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 the diameter of the atom, so the, the, the distance between uh, two, so if you have two atoms that are in contact like this, that are interacting with each other, so their distance will be equal to their, to their diameter, that's going to be the equilibrium distance. The, the cutoff can be about, uh, let's say, three to uh, five times the, this interatomic um, uh, the diameter, which means that if you have a given central atoms, it's going to be interacting with uh, some, uh, a first family of neighbors, with a second family of neighbors, maybe then with a third family of neighbors. And after that, um, you will assume that any atoms that is further away than this cutoff, the, the interaction energy will be so small that you will neglect it. And so what we will assume based on this is that as long as the distance between the a pair of atoms is lower than this cutoff, then we will explicitly compute the, the potential energy, just like we would uh, otherwise do. But as soon as the, uh, the distance becomes larger than this cutoff, then we will just assume that the uh, energy 
becomes zero. And in that case, we just assume that this energy is going to be so small that it's not worth wasting some computing time to calculate something that is just going to be so small. So we will just assume it's zero. And by doing that, so we will do, be doing a small error, but this error will be very small. Uh, we have seen how to calculate this error in the, in the previous lecture. And uh, in this case, the, this error is going to be small, but it's going to save a lot of time because now we, uh, we will not have to calculate uh, all the energy between all the pairs of atoms, uh, between all the n times n minus 1 over 2 pairs of atoms, but we, we will only do it with the, uh, for each central atom, we will only need to calculate the energy with its neighbors. So this is going to save a lot of time. So in practice, what we would do is that for each atom i, uh, and we would do that for each atom individually, so we, uh, we, we look at the position of, their, of the neighbor of position i, the, the neighbor of atom i, then we draw a sphere around atom i where this sphere would have a radius rc where rc is the the cutoff that uh, that we have chosen and then what we would look is that for each atom j then we would calculate the distance between atom i and atom j and then we would look like if the distance between atom i and atom j is lower than the cutoff, then we would calculate the, the energy of interaction between atom i and atom j. So in this case, this is if um, atom j, for example, is um, uh, lower, if, if atom j is uh, small enough to atom i so that their distance is lower than the cutoff, then we would calculate their uh, energy of interaction. But otherwise, if uh, the, the distance is actually larger than the cutoff, then we will just assume that this um, uh, energy is just zero and we will not uh, waste time calculating this energy between atom i and atom j. We will just, just assume that it's so small that it is equal to zero. So by using this approach, you can reduce a lot of times the number of times that you calculate this energy between pairs of atoms. But so far, you still have to calculate the, the distance. If you want to know if a pair of atoms has a distance from each other that is lower or higher than the cutoff, then you still need to calculate this distance. And you need to calculate this distance for every pair of atoms. So you still need to calculate this distance n times n minus n1, n minus 1 over 2 times. So you're still wasting a lot of time calculating distances for a large number of atoms. And as a reminder, to calculate the distance, you need to do this uh, operation of um, calculating the Euclidean distance based on the, um, the, the difference of uh, the, the position of the atoms along the x-axis, y-axis, and the axis, which is an operation that will cost some uh, computing time, especially if you have to do that uh, a large number of times, n minus uh, n times n minus 1 over 2 times. So now the next thing that we are going to see is how do we reduce the number of times that we have to calculate this distance. One first simple idea that we can use here is that rather than calculating the distance to determine whether a given atom is going to be within the sphere, this red sphere here the, that is uh, defined by the, 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 the radius rc, it's actually more computationally efficient to check if uh, a neighbor first is within this cube here uh, where the, 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 the length of this cube would be 2 times rc. So uh, why is it easier to check if an atom is within this cube rather than within the, the sphere with a radius rc? Because if you want to check if an atom is within this cube, all you have to do is to check only the value of dx, delta x, delta y, or delta z. So for example, if you have a given atom j here, if you want to know with 
if this atom j is within the cube, what you need to look at is along the x and y axis, you need to look at the, 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 the distance uh, between atom i and atom j along the x axis and along the, the y axis. And the condition in that case for atom j to be within the cube that is located around atom i is that both delta x and delta y must be smaller than rc. If at least delta x or delta y is larger than rc, then atom y is going to be outside the, the blue cube. And if atom y is outside the blue cube, then necessarily it, it is also outside the, the red sphere. So uh, this operation is much faster because rather than calculating this entire square root of the, the, the square of delta x plus the square of delta y plus the square of delta z, one thing that we can do is just to check if um, the, the distance along the x-axis between uh, atom i and j is uh, lower than the, the cutoff, and if the, the distance along the y-axis is also uh, lower than the, the cutoff, and if the distance along the z-axis is also lower than the cutoff. So if this condition is satisfied, if delta x, delta y, and delta z are all uh, lower than the, than the cutoff, then it means that this atom j is going to be within the cube. And again, this operation to check if atom j is within the, the blue cube is faster than checking if it's within the sphere because you you only have to calculate delta x delta y and delta z which is uh, only in this case a distance so you would just need to calculate for delta y uh, or delta x or delta z the difference between um, the, the the position of um, x uh, of uh, the position x uh, of atom i minus the position a so the position x of atom j minus the position at of atom y and take the, the absolute value of this so that is a, an operation that is just taking a difference which is faster than calculating a square followed by a square root so just simply looking at the, the difference of the coordinates of the pair of atom along the x y and z axis is a faster operation than to calculate the square of delta x delta y delta z followed by a square root so the, the first thing that, that you can do is for atom i, you look at all the neighbors, you check uh, based on their coordinates, are they outside the, the cube or not? And if they are inside the cube, then uh, you will need to check if they are in, within the sphere as well. Because if you just check if they are within the cube, it's possible that you have one atom here that is... Um, outside that is inside the cube but outside the sphere so it's not enough to check if an atom is um, outside the uh, outside or inside the cube if it's inside the cube you you will also need to check if um, if it is also inside the the sphere but at least if you check first if it's inside the cube or not then you will save a lot of time because you will remove all of those atoms here that are so far away that um, either delta x delta y or delta z will be larger than the cutoff rc so that you don't even have to calculate delta x square plus delta y square plus delta z square and take the square root of this because you know already that it's going to be outside the cube so it's not even worth calculating whether it's inside the sphere if it's already outside the cube so this is going to uh, reduce the number of times that you have to calculate the, the distance between pairs of atoms. So now for this approach, you still have to calculate uh, delta x, delta y, and delta z for each pair of atoms, so you're still wasting some time with that. So uh, what we are going to see next is the, the neighbor list algorithm, uh, which can uh, accelerate this computation even further. 
And the idea of this algorithm is that if you have uh, initially a neighbor J that is very far from the, the central atom I, then if you look, if you let the, the simulation continue, so if the atoms are going to move, if you look again, just a, a little bit of time after you have looked at whether atom I is close to atom J or not, if you look a little bit in the future, it's very unlikely that this atom J will have moved enough so that initially it was very far from atom I, and it's very unlikely that now it has become uh, so close that it will start to interact with atom I. So this is going to be the idea of the neighbor list, is that if some atoms are initially far away from each other, then we can assume that at least for some times they will uh, remain far away from each other so that we don't need to calculate their interaction um, energy and their distance at every uh, time because we know that if they are very far away initially they are pretty likely to remain far away for quite a long time. So the idea of the neighbor list algorithm is really to try to reduce the number of time for a given uh, pair of atoms that we have to calculate the distance with respect to each other. Especially if a pair of atoms is initially very far away from each other, then uh, we don't want to calculate the distance between these pairs of atoms all the time because most of the time this distance will just remain very large. So we don't need to calculate this distance all the time because if the atoms are very far away from each other, then uh, it's, it's going to take some time for them to, to come close to each other and to start interacting if their distance becomes smaller than the cutoff. So the, the idea of the neighborless algorithm is that for each atom i, we will define for this atom i a list of potential neighbors. So uh, this list of potential neighbors for atom i is not going to be necessarily exactly the list of its neighbors. The list of the neighbors of atom, I's, of atom i are the, the list of the atoms uh, that are indeed at a distance lower than the, the cutoff. So those are the real neighbors of atom i. But what we are going to define here is the list of potential neighbors, the atoms that are close enough to atom i that they can potentially be neighbors either now or in the near future. So if we want to define this list of potential neighbors, we need to also include some atoms that are not neighbors, but that could potentially become neighbors in the near future because they are very close to the cutoff. So if you look at a given time, so if we take a picture of those atoms, initially here those atoms, they are further away than the, 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 the cutoff, so they are not neighbors, but it's possible that in the very near future they will become neighbors of the central atom because if they are just moving a little bit, it's possible that they will enter this uh, blue sphere and become true neighbors of atom I. So if we want to include the list of all the potential neighbors, then we need to define a, a larger sphere that is larger than the blue sphere. And this uh, larger sphere is going to, its radius is going to be equal to the, the cutoff RC plus an additional distance RS, where RS is what we call the, the skin. So the skin is going to be a small additional distance, which is going to expand this uh, sphere to also include some atoms that are initially not uh, neighbors of uh, atom I, but that are close enough that they can potentially become neighbors in the, the near future. So then what we will assume is that we will define for atom I um, the, the list of the, the neighbors for atom I. So this list of the neighbors will be the list of all the atoms that are within this um, uh, red spheres, and we will assume that those atoms are um, the potential neighbors of, um, of atom I, and whenever we want to find the true neighbors of atom I, we will not, we, we, will, we won't need to calculate the distance between atom I and all the other atoms within the box, 
we will only calculate the distance between atom i and its list of potential neighbors because those are the atoms that are potential neighbors from atom i so those are the atoms that are close enough from atom i so those are the one for which we will want to check explicitly if they they are um, true neighbors so what we would do is whenever we calculate the distance between atom i and its neighbors to check if the distance is lower than rc rather than be doing a loop on all the atoms in the box we will only do a loop on only the atoms that are within the neighbor list of atom i we will only loop on the atoms that are within this red sphere and we will check for those atoms within this red sphere if their distance is lower than rc or not and the good thing about this is that we can keep this neighbor list not just for this time but we can also keep it for the future now if we wait a little bit so if we wait a little bit all those atoms are going to be also moving a little bit so each atoms will have a, a small displacement so those atoms are going to be moving including the central atom i all of those atoms are going to have a, a slight displacement which means that now if we want to uh, recalculate the the distance between the atoms all of the distance between the atoms will now have changed because each of those atoms have moved a little bit but because we have already um, included all the potential neighbors um, uh, of atom i within this red sphere it is very unlikely that uh, an atom that was not a potential neighbor from atom i it's very unlikely that this atom would have traveled so much that it could now be a true neighbor so we don't need to check if some atoms that are that were initially very far away from atom i are now neighbors from atom i we only need to check within the potential neighbors of atom i within its neighbor list within this red sphere here we only need to check for those atoms if after the, they have moved a little bit if they are now at a distance that is lower than rc uh, from the central atom and all of those atoms that were initially um, not potential neighbors that were too far away that were outside this um, red uh, sphere we don't even need to check even after they have moved we don't need to check uh, if their distance is now uh, smaller the distance from atom i is now smaller than rc we don't need to check that because they were so far away to begin with that it's unlikely that they have moved enough that they are now a neighbor of atom i and so we can keep doing that so even if the atoms now start uh, moving a, a little bit more so each atom will continue moving uh, over time we can again assume that uh, even after they have moved uh, a little bit more uh, we will keep assuming that we don't need to recalculate the distance with all the, the the atoms within the box we will only calculate the distance between atom i and its list of potential neighbor its uh, neighbor list so this this neighbor list is very efficient because it means that it greatly reduces the number of time you have to calculate the the distance between pairs of atoms um, so it means that now you have to calculate for each atom i the distance with only its list of potential neighbors which is a much smaller number than all the other atoms that you have within the box so now we cannot keep this neighbor list forever because even if an atom is initially very far from atom i if you wait for a long enough time then this atom eventually can move enough that it can now become an atom uh, a neighbor of atom i similarly this atom i is also going to move so it's also possible that this atom i will start moving and will now become a neighbor of this atom j even if it was initially very far away so at some point we cannot keep the name the same neighbor list forever at some point we will need to reset the neighbor list and recalculate a new list of potential neighbors for example if this atom i is eventually moving here we will need to recalculate a new neighbor list uh, a new uh, 
uh, list of potential neighbors for for uh, for the atom i. So the question is, when do we need to calculate to reset this neighbor list? When do we need to say that okay, we had calculated the list of the potential neighbors for atom i initially, and this allowed us to save time? But now they have the atoms have moved enough that we cannot be sure that uh, an atom that was initially outside the, the red sphere can now potentially become a neighbor. Now it's possible that an atom that was initially outside the red sphere have now become inside the blue sphere. If you just wait a little bit, so maybe you had an atom that was here, maybe it has moved a little bit and now it is inside the red sphere. Uh, so this is fine. Uh, it's possible that you will have this situation that some atoms will start moving a little bit. They were initially outside the red sphere and now they will come out inside the red sphere. But at some point, if this atom continue to move and now becomes inside the, the blue sphere, now this should be a neighbor. And if it's a neighbor, then we should count it. So at some point, when some atoms that were outside the red sphere have a chance now to be inside the blue sphere, now we will need to reset the neighbor list. We need to say, okay, now we cannot trust the list of the potential neighbors that we initially defined. We need to redefine this neighbor list. We need to reset the list of the neighbors, the list of the potential neighbors. So what is the condition at which we know that we cannot trust the initial neighbor list anymore, that we have to um, redefine, to reset the neighbor list? So there is two things that can happen. And here, if you want to be sure that you are never missing a neighbor, then you need to assume the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that initially you had a neighbor that was outside the, the neighbor list and maybe it was just outside the neighbor list. Um, so this is an atom J, it was just outside the neighbor list. Now this atom J, will start to move and the worst case scenario is that this atom um, j move exactly towards i now it's also possible that this atom i is also going to move and worst case scenario is that this atom i is going to move straight towards atom j so the worst case scenario is that if those two start moving straight uh, in the direction of each other then at some point they will become neighbor so if we want to make sure that we are never missing any neighbor, what we can do is to track the uh, displacement of the atoms. So it's um, easy to do that because that's the point of the simulation. The simulation is going to be predicting the motion of the atoms. So we can track the, the displacement of the atoms. And specifically here, what we'll care is about the um, tracking the maximum displacement of the atoms. So we, we will track the motion of the atoms in the box and to what we will do is to check what is the atom that has moved the most and uh, including the, the central atom I. We take all the atoms within the box and we check which one is the atom that has moved the most. Now, so this, um, this, uh, this displacement, so we can write it uh, delta R max, that's the maximum displacement of the atoms. So now we need to assume the worst case scenario. We need to assume that both atom I and um, uh, the atoms that have moved the most, that they are moving straight towards each other. So this is the, the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that atom I and atom J, atom J was just outside the neighbor list. Now, uh, this atom I and atom J, they have moved towards each other with this displacement delta R max. So now the condition we need to check based on this, uh, what is the, the, the condition that now those atom I and atom J uh, are now neighbors from each other. And the condition is that um, if uh, atom I uh, was initially outside uh, the, the neighbor list. The condition for this atom I to go inside is that it must travel by at least a distance that is equal to the skin. If atom I 
if, if, the, if the atom that is moving the most, that has a displacement delta r max, if this atom that is moving the most has a displacement that is still lower than the skin, then there is no chance that this atom was initially outside the red sphere and now becomes inside the blue sphere. So if, if delta r max is lower than the skin, then there is no chance that this atom that was initially outside has now become a neighbor. But if the, the, the maximum displacement is larger than the skin, then the, if this atom was slightly outside the neighbor list, then it's possible that now it's inside the blue sphere. So now, uh, so that's the first condition. But now there is also another thing is that this atom I can also move and this atom I potentially can also move by uh, with a maximum displacement delta r max. So if both delta uh, i, if both atom i is moving with a displacement delta r max and atom j is also moving to, uh, with the same displacement, now it's possible that um, those atoms will meet each other and will become each other sooner. And now what we need to consider is not just simply the displacement of atom j, but we need to consider the relative displacement of atom j with respect to atom i. So now if we consider the relative displacement, now we get a factor 2, because not only um, this atom i will have moved towards the right, but this atom j uh, will have moved towards the, the left. So now the distance, the new distance between atom i and atom j will not have decreased simply by r max, it will now have decreased by two times r max. The new distance between atom i and atom j has now decreased by um, two times delta r max. So now the condition that we have to check to, uh, to, to check whether it's possible that an atom i that was initially outside the neighbor list could now have possibly become a neighbor is to check if here, this, this, this decrease in the distance between atom i and atom j. So this, in the worst case scenario, the decrease in the distance between atom i and atom j is going to be two times delta r max. This is if atom i and atom j are moving straight toward each other and if they, are, if they have the maximum displacement. So if this decrease in the, in the distance between atom i and atom j is... Um, uh, is larger than uh, the, the skin if the, the decrease of the distance between atom i and atom j is larger than the, the distance within the skin, the distance here between the, the red sphere and the blue sphere, then we need to uh, reset the, the neighbor list. Now we cannot be sure that the initial neighbor list that we initially um, uh, uh, constructed. We constructed the list of all the neighbors for um, uh, uh, for each atom. Now, we can, if, if two atoms are moving enough towards each other, and if they are moving, if their relative motion becomes larger than the skin, then we need to reset the neighbor list. We cannot be sure that the initial neighbor list is still valid. So now the next question is, how do we choose the skin. Everything depends on the skin. So the, the condition for which you will uh, reset the neighbor list depends on the, the skin that you are choosing. So what is the, the, the right way to choose the skin? So there, the, um, there is going to be an optimal value for the skin. And what we are going to discuss now is what is the issue if the, the skin becomes too small and what is the potential issue when the skin becomes too large so that we can choose an optimal skin distance that is in between uh, those two extreme values. So the, the first thing is, let's assume that we choose a very small skin like this. So um, let's choose a small skin. So this is, in that case, the, what you would get with a very small skin. So choosing the advantage of choosing a small skin is that you will have um, a small neighbor list. So if you choose um, a small skin, then the list of the neighbors that you will have for each atom is going to be uh, pretty small and it's going to be very close. The list of the potential neighbors of atom I is going to be very close to the, to the list of the real neighbors because your skin is very 
small, so you would have only a very small, uh, very limited number of neighbors that are actually uh, within the neighbor list, but not actual neighbors. So you will save a lot of time because you will not have to calculate the distance between atom I and uh, many other atoms because your neighbor list will be very small. So that's the advantage. The drawback of choosing a neighbor list, uh, a skin that is very small, is that you will need to reset the neighbor list quite often because now, uh, since you have a small neighbor list, it's very, it's very likely that just um, a, with, after a little bit of time, an atom that was initially outside the red sphere can now go inside the, the blue sphere. So the condition uh, for which you need to um, uh, reset the neighbor list, the condition that two times the, the maximum displacement is uh, larger than the, the skin, if the skin is very small, then this condition is going to be fulfilled pretty quickly. So you will need to uh, reset the, the neighbor list uh, quite often. So you will need to reset the, the neighbor list often. And resetting the neighbor list takes a lot of computing time because you will, every time you need to reset the neighbor list, now you will need to check for all the other atoms within the box if they are uh, at a distance that is lower than the, 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 the cutoff plus the skin. So and whenever you need to um, uh, redefine the neighbor list, now you will need to do a loop with all the neighbors again, calculate their distance, and check if the, the distance between atom I and atom J is lower than the cutoff plus the, the skin. So you will need to check again if those neighbors are outside the red sphere. So the advantage is that within this neighbor list algorithm, you only have to do it once and you will keep the, name, the same neighbor list until you have to reset it. But if you choose a small skin, then you will need to reset this neighbor list quite often because you will keep having some atoms that move enough that they can, uh, that initially they were not within the neighbor list, but now there is a risk that they have become a neighbor. So you will waste some time by redefining, by resetting the neighbor list all the time. So now, if you want to avoid this, then what you can do is to increase the skin. So now what would be the, the potential drawback of choosing now a large uh, neighbor skin? So the advantage of choosing um, a large skin is that now you will uh, you will um, the, the 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 reset of the the neighbor list will be uh, rare. Uh, why? Because if you have a very large neighbor list, now it becomes very it's going to be very rare that an atom that was outside the neighbor list has now moved enough to be inside the skin. You will, you will be able to keep the same neighbor list for a longer time and you won't have to reset it very often because you have a, a, a large skin. So you have a large margin of safety that uh, initially if an atom was outside the, the red sphere, now it's going to be, it's going to take a very long time for these atoms to travel enough so that it can move inside the blue sphere. The drawback is that now if you choose a large skin, then you will get a large uh, neighbor list because now uh, you will um, still have a lot of potential neighbors. So including some neighbors that are actually pretty far from atom I, now all of those neighbors will be potential neighbors of atom I. So you will still need to calculate uh, a lot of uh, distance between atom I and other neighbors. So you will get a larger uh, neighbor list. So it means that you will not need to reset the neighbor list, but every time you calculate the distance between atom I and its list of potential neighbors, you will waste some time because you have to do this for uh, many times because you have a large neighbor list. So the optimal value of the skin
will be somewhere in between those extreme values. You need to choose the skin to be large enough so that you don't have to reset the neighbor list often, but also small enough because otherwise uh, you need uh, that you will waste some time by computing uh, the, the distance between amatomai and a lot of other atoms. So in practice, what you need to do is to try different value of the skin and to see uh, what is the optimal value of the skin for which you will have the, the maximum efficiency. It, there is no universal rule on how to choose the, the skin. It depends on how much the atoms are moving. For example, if you are simulating a system at low temperature, then the atoms are mostly frozen. The only thing that those atoms are going to be doing is simply to vibrate around their average position. So in that case, if you have some atoms that are simply just vibrating, they are not really moving, then it's fine to use a very small skin because you want to reduce the size of the neighbor list as, as, as more as you can. And since the atoms are just vibrating, then it's, it's very unlikely that an atom will move enough uh, and will move more than the size of the skin. So in that case, at low temperature, if the atoms are not moving, it's preferable to use a small skin. On the other hand, if you are at high temperature, then the atoms are moving a lot, then you will need to use a larger skin because otherwise you will, keep, you will need to keep resetting the neighbor list all the time, which will defeat the purpose of the neighbor list. So in that case, if you want to save some time with this neighbor list algorithm, you will need at higher temperature, if the atoms are moving a lot, then you will need to choose a larger skin to make sure that your neighbor list can survive over time uh, without having to be reset. So in that case, the, the choice, the optimal choice of the skin um, will depend on how much the atoms are moving. Uh, and what you can do in practice is just to do a, 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 a test simulation and to do this simulation for different value of the skin and to see which one gives you the, the highest computational efficiency and to uh, adjust the skin uh, accordingly to try to minimize the, the computing time needed to, to perform a test simulation. So now the last thing that we are going to discuss is in practice within a simulation, how will you implement the, the neighbor list? So in this case, we need to define a distinct neighbor list for each atom. So each atom within the box will be surrounded by its own uh, red sphere, which will be the its own neighbor list. So each atom within the box will have its own dedicated neighbor list. So let's assume that for example we have n atoms within the box. This is the number of atoms. Now the second thing that we need is we need to estimate what is within the, assuming a worst case scenario, what is going to be the, the maximum size of the neighbor list. So for this we need to estimate what is the maximum number uh, of potential neighbors and for this example we can estimate like if you have a given uh, central atom i if it's fully surrounded with a completely packed structure of neighbors like this then we can estimate what is the maximum uh, theoretical number of neighbors that you can have within a sphere with a, a, a radius that uh, is equal to rc plus uh, the skin. So this is the radius of the neighbor list. So we can estimate, theoretically speaking, what is the maximum number of potential neighbors. That's going to be the maximum size of the, the neighbor list. Now, so for each, uh, for each atom, each atom I is going to have a given uh, neighbor list where uh, the, the neighbor list will be the list of all the other atoms that are the potential neighbors of uh, atom I. And this list will be smaller. The number of uh, potential neighbors from, for atom I will, will be smaller than the, the, no, the maximum theoretical size of the neighbor list. So the first thing that we will need to do is for each atom I to store within an array the number of potential neighbors that it have. So for this, we will need to define an array that is the number of neighbors 
and this array will be defined for each atom. So it's going to be an array with a size that is given by the size um, by the number of atoms that you have in your box. And so this array will look like this. So for each um, atom ID, so for each atom um, ID, uh, where uh, this is going to be the, the, the atom ID, uh, the, the integer I uh, for each atom, for each atom ID, you will store the number of potential neighbors that it has. So you will store um, within this array for atom ID 1, 2, 3, etc. And you will do it for all the atoms within the box until the last one, where the last one will be equal to, uh, we have, will have an ID that is equal to the number of atoms within the box. Then you will, ch you will store how many potential neighbors that it has. So you will store how many um, uh, uh, atoms is there in their neighbor list. So for example, maybe this um, atom one will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, potential neighbors, the number of neighbors within its neighbor list. Maybe the second one is going to have 10, eight, etc. Maybe this one, 11, etc. So we need to store um, for each atom, how many potential neighbors does it have? So now that now that we have this information, we need now another array, which is going to be an array that will now contain actually the list of the of the neighbors. So this array will now be a two dimensional array that will store for each atom uh, ID for each atom I, it will store what are the um, the other ideas of the neighbors. So we the for what we will do now is that for each atom i we will store the list of all the the ids uh, where the idea is, is going to be an integer ranging between one to the to the um, to the number of atoms in the box we need to store the id the of all the neighbors within the neighbor list of atom i so that's going to be now a two dimensional array that will have the dimension of first the number of atoms that you have in your box and the second dimension will be the the maximum number of neighbors that a given atom can have in its neighbor list so this idea will look like this so first you will need to define the list of neighbors for each uh, atom so the first column will be the the ID of the central atom. So that's going to be the uh, example for atom one, atom two, atom three, etc. And we will need to do that for all the atoms within the box. So this is going to be the, the, the ID of the central atom, like atom I, for example. Then for each of this atom, we will need to store the list of its neighbors. So we need to store the list of the ID of the neighbors. So we need to store the ID of uh, neighbor one, the ID of uh, neighbor two, the idea of uh, neighbor three, etc., up to the, 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 the maximum number that uh, an, an atom can have, the maximum number of potential neighbors that an atom can have, and this maximum number is this uh, max neighbor integer that we uh, that we define so that's going to be the, the the size that's going to be the number of columns of this array and then what we will do is to now store um, the, the, the 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 ideas of the actual neighbors so for example if this is in this case central atom one the the neighbors of this atom one will be maybe atom 11 so that's going to be one neighbor Atom uh, 3 is uh, another neighbor. Uh, atom um, 24 is another neighbor, etc. And we will need to um, uh, put the ideas of all the neighbors. Now, since the actual list, the actual number of neighbors of atom 1 is going to be lower than the maximum number of neighbors, 
then the, the remaining at some point uh, the, we will not be able to fill completely this uh, this array here because there is just going to be not enough neighbors to fully populate this so we need to stop whenever we have reached the maximum uh, number of uh, neighbors for atom one in the case of atom one we know that there is nine potential neighbors so we will need to 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 fill uh, the first nine columns of this uh, of this matrix and then we will just fill the rest with some zeros whenever we have already reached the number of neighbors now we will need to do that uh, again for atom two so atom two maybe is going to be connected to um, to atom 3, to atom 5, to atom uh, 72, etc. And then we will fill the rest with some zero. We need to do the same for atom 3. We know that atom 3 necessarily is connected to atom 1 because atom 1 was connected to atom 3, uh, etc. So we'll just um, uh, fill uh, all the neighbors for each of those atoms. And now, so this array will be the, the connectivity array, this array will tell you for each uh, given um, atom, so for atom 3, what is the list of its potential neighbors. And now whenever you will need to check for uh, a given atom what is the list of the actual neighbors, so you will need to calculate the distance and check if this distance is smaller than the cutoff. And so whenever you do that for atom 3, to find the neighbors of atom 3, rather than doing that for all the atoms within the box you will only need to do a loop on the, um, the the line that corresponds to the atom so whenever for example if you want to find the, the the neighbors of atom 2 you will just do a loop within the second line of this um, of this array and to do a loop on the its three neighbors here or actually for atom 2 we have 10 neighbors so you will need to do a loop on the 10 uh, potential neighbors of atom 2 and to check whether their distance from the central atom 2 is smaller than the cutoff. So this is in practice how you would do is you will store those two um, arrays and you will simply do a loop uh, of all the neighbors between uh, um, 1 and, uh, and 10 for atom 2. You have 10 neighbors so you will just do a loop on uh, uh, from at a neighbor one, neighbor two, neighbor three, up to neighbor ten, and check within those ten atoms which one are uh, at a distance lower than the cutoff. And this will allow you to save a lot of time to do this loop only based on the ten potential neighbors rather than on all the the, the other atoms that are within the box. So this is uh, in this case uh, this neighbor list algorithm is an efficient algorithm to save you a lot of time to uh, avoid calculating the distance uh, between the atoms within the box. So by combining those two things, by combining the cutoff, by using the cutoff, you can save a lot of time by avoiding to compute the energy between the atoms. And now by using the neighbor list algorithm, now you can save even more time by uh, avoiding to calculate the distance between the atoms. So this will allow you to save some time when you do your simulation and to make your simulation as efficient as possible so that uh, you minimize the, the computational burden that is required for your simulation to be conducted.